Thank you for joining. If, um, if you missed our first session on Thursday, uh, we talked about introduction to city business, which uh, was recorded and we have a presentation similar to the one that you're gonna see today that will be uh, available to everybody. But uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you to um, business community as well as our local agency representative who are here with us today as well. So um, today's presentation is, let's see. Uh, we're gonna have um, go over the content of this presentation, which include preliminary notes, go uh, over the agenda and speakers. Um, as Ms. Margaret said, this presentation is divided in three parts. And at the end of the third part, we'll have a conclusion and a QA and a uh, session. The preliminary notes, um, if you missed our presentation uh, last week, I um, wanted to uh, re, um, represent the uh, um, bureaus who are involved today in this presentation. So the uh, Bureau of Purchasing serves as the central authority for all seated board and commissions, procurement and purchasing needs. Our mission is to serve the public by modernizing procurement and contracting procedures, implementing a fair and transparent procurement process while engaging local businesses and maximizing purchasing value by applying the best procurement practices. The other office who's presenting today is the Office of Supply Diversity, uh, which oversees certification, compliance, outreach, training, and capacity building for the city's Equal Business Opportunity Program. Such program is designed to mitigate the effects of past and present social disadvantage, economic disadvantage and discrimination by increasing the utilization of certified DBEs in the procurement of goods and services by the city of New York. Um, let's go over quickly, as Ms. Margaret presented before, the agenda and the speakers. Um, the first part, part one, which will be about the city procurement methods will be presented by Ms. Kai Wells, Assistant Purchasing Administrator of the Bureau of Purchasing. Part two, uh, regarding the response to an opportunity, which I'll present. And part three will be about DBE um, certification, DBE requirements presented by Mr. Matthew Cullinan, the Compliance Officer with the Office of Supply Risk. So it's not DBE certification, but DBE requirements. Apologize for this. Um, this word is not appearing there. So um, we're gonna go to part one, the city's procurement methods presented by Ms. Kai Wells. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Julian. So good afternoon, everyone. As Julian noted, I'm Kai Wells, the Assistant Purchasing Administrator in the Bureau of Purchasing. So let's discuss the city's procurement methods. Next slide. Let's start with a few basic questions. How does the city buy goods and services? What are the main characteristics of those procurement methods? What should you look for in the solicitation? What are the common mistakes? And last, some tips to submitting a successful bid or proposal. So how does the city buy goods and services? Next slide. The city uses four competitive methods to procure goods and services. Those methods are invitation to quote, also known as an ITQ, invitation to bid, also known as an ITB, request for proposals, also known as an RFP, and request for qualifications, also known as an RFQ. So now that we have identified the four procurement methods, Let's take a closer look at each. Let's start with the invitation to quote or ITQ process. An invitation to quote is a method to seek public competition for purchases of goods and non-professional services valued over $1,000, but less than $20,000. When this method is used, the award of the purchase order is based upon the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. A few good examples of goods and services the city would traditionally utilize an ITQ to purchase would be the, per, the procurement of copier paper or office supplies. So a relevant example 
of an ITQ that we currently have on our portal now is ITQ number 1293 for North C for Ute Summer Camp t-shirts. So now that we have a better understanding of what an ITQ is, let's highlight the main characteristics of an ITQ. ITQs are released for five days. Quotes are kept confidential and open on the submission deadline. The successful bidder will be the lowest responsive responsible bidder. This will be the bidder with the lowest price who met all of the requirements in terms of the following the ITQ instructions, providing all of the required documentation, and who is also capable of performing the services or providing the goods requested. Once the lowest responsive responsible bidder has been identified, the city will issue a PO to, or a purchase order to that vendor. Now that we have discussed what an ITQ is and the main characteristics of this procurement method, the next slides will show an illustration of the first few pages of an ITQ that is currently active on the supplier portal. We invite you to go to the supplier portal to take a closer look at the event in its entirety. Let's now take a closer look at the invitation to bid or ITB. An invitation to bid is the standard method when public competition is sought for purchases of goods or non-professional services valued at more than $20,000 or public works valued at more than $150,000. When this process is used, the contract award is based upon the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. A couple of A couple of examples of goods or services the city would traditionally utilize an ITB to procure would be the procurement of security guard services or janitorial services. An example of a existing active bid that we currently have now is the ITB number 1254 for EMD for Ford Heavy Truck Repairs. Now that we have a better understanding of what an ITB is, let's highlight the main characteristics of an ITB. The city advertises ITBs for 30 calendar days to allow time for potential bid, pre-bid conference, but also to provide a period for questions and answers. Bids are kept confidential and open publicly on the submission deadline in a public bid opening. The bid will ultimately be awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. This will be the bidder offering the most, offering the lowest price, who met all of the bid requirements, followed all of the bid instructions, provided all the required documentation, and who is capable of completing the job or providing the goods requested. The city will issue an intent to award letter to the successful bidder. The city and the successful bidder will execute a written contract that incorporates by reference the invitation to bid and the bid proposal. Unless there is a specific provision in the bid that contemplates changes such as an escalation clause, no changes are allowed. Now that we have discussed what an ITQ is, ITB, and the main characteristics of this procurement method, the next slide will show an illustration of the first few pages of an ITB that is currently active on the supplier portal. Again, we invite you to go to the supplier portal to take a closer look at this event in its entirety. Now let's take a closer look at the request for proposal or RFP. A request for proposal or RFP is the standard method used for competitive purchases for professional services costing more than $15,000 and an award is based on best value rather than the lowest price. Proposals are evaluated and ranked according to the criteria identified in the RFP. The award is made after the review of scores and rationale of the evaluation committee based on criteria. An example of services the city would traditionally utilize an RFP to procure would be the procurement of certified public accountant or CPA to perform audits. A current example on the supplier portal would be RFP number 1246 for Homeland Security for emergency transportation school bus services. 
Now that we have a better understanding of what an RFP is, let's highlight the main characteristics of an RFP. RFPs are advertised for 30 days to allow time for a potential pre-submittal conference, but also to provide a period for questions and answers. Only those responsive proposals shall be forwarded to the selection committee. Responsive proposals are those inclusive of all the required documentation as per the RFP. The selection committee will evaluate the responsive proposals in a public meeting and make a recommendation to negotiate and enter into contract with the respondent offering the best value to the city based on the technical criteria. The city may ask for additional information from respondents during the evaluation process if necessary. Following the selection, the city will issue an intent to award letter to the successful respondent. Upon the issuance of the letter, the city can negotiate with the successful respondent. Once negotiations have commenced, the successful respondent and the city will execute a written contract. Now that we have discussed what an RFP is and the main characteristics of this procurement method, the next couple of slides will show an illustration of the first few pages of an RFP that is currently active on the supplier portal. Again, we invite you to go to the supplier portal to take a closer look at this event in its entirety. Let's take a closer look at the request for qualifications or RFQ. A request for qualifications or RFQ is another method to obtain competitive purchases for professional services costing more than $15,000. And an award is based on the qualifications of respondents. The selection of architects or engineers is typically accomplished through an RFQ. Similar to the RFP, the award is made after review of scores and rationale of the evaluation committee based on criteria. Another example of services the city would traditionally utilize an RFQ to procure would be the procurement of legal services. In this instance, unlike an RFP, after review of scores and rationale of the evaluation committee based on the criteria, multiple respondents are qualified with the intent of releasing a subsequent RFP for specific legal, for a specific legal cases as they arise. Now that we have a better understanding of what an RFQ is, let's highlight the main characteristics of an RFQ. RFQs are advertised for 30 calendar days to allow for a potential pre-submittal conference, but also to provide a period for questions and answers. Only those responsive submissions shall be forwarded to the selection committee. Responsive submissions are those inclusive of all the required documentation as per the RFQ. So the selection committee will evaluate the responsive submissions in a public meeting and may make a recommendation to negotiate and enter into contract with the respondents offering the best value to the city based on the technical criteria or to qualify respondents with the intent of issuing a subsequent RFP to make a selection for a specific project, task, or case. The city may ask for additional information from respondents during the evaluation process if necessary. The city will issue an intent to award letters, issue intent to award letters or qualification letters to the successful respondents. Upon issue of the award letter, the city can negotiate with the selected respondents. Once negotiations have commenced the successful, with the successful respondent, the city will execute a written contract, will, will execute written contracts. Now that we have discussed what, now that we have discussed what an RFQ is and the main characteristics of this procurement method, the next few slides will show an illustration of the first few pages of an RFQ that is currently active on the supplier portal. Again, we invite you to visit the supplier portal to take a closer look at this event in its entirety. Now that we have discussed all four procurement methods, let's delve into some of the main characteristics that differ from one procurement method to another. The types of the type of goods and services. The procurement method the city utilizes varies depending upon the type of goods or services it is seeking. If the city seeks to procure non-professional services, the city will release an ITQ or an ITB to procure said services. In contrast, if the city seeks to procure professional services, 
the city will release an RFP or an RFQ to procure those services. The advertisement. As I'm sure you notice, the advertisement period may vary. While we advertise ITVs, RFPs, and RFQs for 30 calendar days, in stark comparison, ITQs are only released for five days. Formality, informal versus formal. The level of formal formality differs. While ITQs are informal in nature, ITBs, RFPs, and RFQs are formal and thus have much more stringent requirements. The thresholds. The thresholds make a significant impact on the method of procurement the city will utilize. If you recall, if the city seeks to procure goods or services for more than $1,000 but less than $20,000, the ITQ process will be utilized. Alternately, if the city will procure goods and services for more than $20,000, the ITB process will be the method utilized. The evaluation process. The presence or absence of an evaluation process will depend upon the procurement method. If you recall, following the submission of responses to an RFP or an RFQ, a selection committee will evaluate the responses in a public meeting. In contrast, following the submission of responses to an ITB, the city will enter into contract with the lowest responsive responsible bidder in the absence of an evaluation process. The award method, low, lowest versus best value. The award method varies depending upon the procurement method being utilized. While the city is seeking the lowest price quote or bid when utilizing an ITQ or an ITB, alternately in the case of an RFPs or RFQs, the city is seeking the respondent or respondents offering the best value to the city. Purchase order versus written contract. The end result of the procurement methods differ. Following an ITQ, a purchase order will be issued to the selected vendor. While following the selection of a vendor or vendors for an ITB, RFP, or RFQ, the city and the selected vendor or vendors will enter into written contract or contracts. So now that we have discussed the various factors that will differ per the varying procurement methods, Let's now take this opportunity to sort of delve into the specific things that you should pay attention to in the varying procurement methods. So what should you look for in an ITB? Obviously the submission deadline is pretty important as you need to know when you must submit your bid quotes, bid or quotes. The submission requirements bid and post bid. Did we skip a slide, the ITQ slide? Okay, I'll just go through it. So what should you look for in an ITQ? Obviously, the submission deadline is pretty important as you need to know when you must submit your bid slash quotes. The submission requirement, cost and attachment. You need to know when you, will be when you will be required to submit your quote. The budget. It is important to know how much the city has budgeted for the needed good or service. The specifications. It is important to know what the city is looking for. And lastly, the point of contact. Who can you reach out to if you have questions? Now let's discuss what you should look for in an ITB. The submission deadline, bid and post bid. It is important to know when you will need to submit your bid as well as any required post bid documentation. The submission requirements, bid and post bid. It is critical to ensure that you know the hows, whens and wheres of the submission requirements for your bid and post bid documentation. The points of contact. It is imperative to know who you can contact particularly because there will be a cone of silence in place following the issuance of an ITQ until the award and contacting anyone outside of the individuals expressly noted in the ITB shall lead to disqualification. The specifications. It is imperative to review the specifications to understand what the city is looking for. Insurance requirements. It is important to acquaint yourself with the insurance requirements as 
the minimum insurance requirements in the ITB will be the insurance requirements for the contract and the forms. It's important to familiarize yourself with the forms included in the bid as these documents will need to be submitted at varying phases of the bid and contract routing process. Lastly, let's take a look at what you should look for in an RFP or an RFQ. The submission deadline. It's important to know when you will need to submit your proposal or submission. The submission requirements. It is critical to ensure that you know the hows, whens, and wheres of the submission requirements. The anticipated timetable. The anticipated timetable features all of the pertinent deadlines, such as the date to submit your DBE interest submission, the date of the pre-submittal conference, the deadline for submitting questions, as well as the submission deadline. The technical criteria. The technical criteria provide a glimpse into how the selection committee will judge or evaluate your response. The points of contact. It is imperative to know who you can contact, particularly because there will be a cone of silence in place following the issuance of an RFP or RFQ until award. And contacting anyone outside of the individuals expressly noted in the RFP or RFQ shall lead to disqualification. The required attachments. It is important to familiarize yourself with the required attachments, as these documents must be submitted with the RFP or RFQ response. Attachment A, also known as needed services. It is important to know what the city is looking for. And last, the other information. It is important to review any additional information provided in exhibits or attachments as they may contain other pertinent information about the RFP or RFQ. Now that we have discussed what to look for when reviewing the various types of solicitations, now let's take a moment to discuss the most common mistakes so that you can be sure to avoid them. One common mistake is not submitting your response on time. It is imperative that you submit your responses by the submission deadline and time. Another common mistake is not submitting responses in the correct format. Be sure to submit your response in the formatted as noted within the solicitation. Another common mistake, failing to meet the specifications or scope of work. This is why it's imperative to ensure that you read these specifications, the scope of work or the needed services in the solicitations to ensure that you are meeting those specifications or that need that the city has expressed failing to sign the documentation or indicate intent to be bound. It's, it is imperative that, that is why it's imperative that you familiarize yourself with all of the forms so that you can ensure that you are signing and as well as notarizing any documents that require signatory or notary. Um, failing to provide the required documentation. As noted previously, there are certain documents that are required to be submitted with your submission. So please be sure to review the RFPs, RFQs, and the ITBs carefully to ensure that you know what, what documents those are. And failing to attend a meeting or job site if required. Be sure to review the timetables for the RFPs and RFQs as it will let you know if there is a pre-submittal conference and if that meeting is mandatory, as well as it would also include any job site visits if there are any that apply. And be sure to review the bids as the bids will also indicate if there is a pre-bid meeting and if it is mandatory or if it's voluntary. And it will also include any information as it relates to any job site visits. Now that you are familiar with the most common mistakes respondents make, here are some helpful tips to submitting a successful bid or proposal. Most importantly, read everything. You wanna make sure you read the, the solicitations carefully. Next, ask questions. If, be sure to ask questions if, they, if clarity is needed regarding the specifications, the requirements, the forms, or the timelines. Next, do not wait until the last minute. 
Be sure that you don't wait until the last minute to submit your responses. Our due dates are firm dates and we cannot accept responses even if they are only one minute late. Next, research the prior procurement and or contract. It is useful to review the prior procurements or contracts as they may provide some additional information that may be, may be helpful in submitting your response. Monitor the notifications for any modifications to the solicitation. We typically release addendums if there are any modifications or changes that need to be made to the solicitation. So be sure to monitor the supplier portal to see if there are any addendums that may modify or change or augment and add to any of the information that was previously provided in the solicitation. Use the city's forms. As noted before, the forms are very um, important. It's important to familiarize yourself with those forms and be sure that you use the city's forms and no other forms. Check your math. Be sure to check your math for any, any mathematical errors prior to submitting your response. And last, include all required documentation. Not submitting the required documentation will lead to your response being deemed non-responsive. So that is, is imperative. So now that I have discussed all of the procurement methods, I'm going to turn it over to Julian to discuss how you would go about responding to an actual event in brass. Thank you, uh, Kai, very much. Uh, this is Julian again, and I apologize for not supporting your presentation on the ITQ. We'll make sure that the presentation include that slide and uh, file version that we distribute to everybody. So. Uh, thank you, Kai. This time, uh, for this part, I'm going to uh, go through a, um, a fictitious um, situation of acting as a, as a supplier. But before that, I just wanted to uh, go over a little bit of the, the basic question, uh, if I can change the page. Here we go. So, a uh, basic question. What is Brass? What are the features of the supply portal? Uh, how do I respond to an opportunity via the supply portal? And finally, how are procurement and DB connected? So what is BRAS? Uh, BRAS stands for Budget Requisition and Accounting Services System. This is the new financial platform that the city launched in June 2019, where we switched from four to five legacy financial platforms to one that helped the city and all departments um, handling their budget requisition accounting into one place. This new platform is critical for supplier management, bidding opportunities, purchase order and contract, invoice submission and payment release. Those are some of the main features of this new system that we have. And the supplier portal is the external interface of Brass with individuals and entities who wish to do business with the city. Um, what are the features of the supplier portal? So um, it helps the, our department especially um, to automate event and addendum notification to supplies of a register in the portal. There's a free and quick enrollment and you have a 24 seven access. Self enrollment and account maintenance. This is your account as a supplier. You maintain it uh, the way you want it. Uh, obviously keeping uh, information, your uh, login password is critical to be able to access it. It make your company visible to city departments because on the, uh, on the side of the city, departments have access to the information you provide, especially a, a website and email address for port of contact, the name of uh, the primary contact for the supplier account. Allows online responses instead of submitting paper. We're gonna go over uh, an example in a, in a, few, a few minutes but it help us um, um, maintaining responses, a submission by, by, uh, by vendors in electronic fashion rather than, than paper. Um, this um, system is required for an award of an event when it's posted on the supply portal. It's also required for, for payment. So now I would like to uh, show you an example on how to respond to uh, a, a fictitious event by a fictitious supplier during this, uh, this session. And the scenario is 
I'm going to act as the owner of this company called Test LLC. Um, I noticed that the Bureau of Purchasing uh, released an invitation to quote on the supplier portal as they are looking to purchase executive chairs for their conference room. Um, before I leave the screen and, and go into a, a test environment to show you the steps, I just want to let you know that when you are going to the supplier portal, on the landing page of the supplier portal, we have uh, links to uh, various uh, tutorials, and one of them is how to respond to a bidding opportunity. So um, what I'm going to show you are just, uh, it's an example, a specific example, but the tutorial you have on the supplier portal will um, guide you over the very generic um, steps that you can do for the other type of opportunity. So I'm going to leave that screen for a second and get to a test environment in a moment. So just bear with me for a second. Just going into different portal. There we go. So I'm going to now um, um, go into supply portal, which is our test environment in this case. But um, I just wanted to show you, um, it, even if when you're not registered as a supplier, um, if you want to see what a type of events are currently open, but currently ongoing for the city, you go to supplier portal in the menu top left, you would see events and you will click on Rouse open events, which will show you what an open event is basically a, a solicitation that the Bureau of Purchasing posted in the supplier portal, which is live ongoing where you have the ability to submit a response. And as I mentioned in my example, that I'm looking for this event, uh, event number one, two, three, four, I call ITQ executive chairs, and I see that's uh, an informal type. As informal means it's an uh, invitation to court. And the reference is where it says typically what, which department is the sponsoring department behind this ITQ. If I go further right, I will see open date is when this ITQ was released. So it was today at 9.30 a.m. And uh, this event is closing, meaning that the deadline to respond to this event is tomorrow by 9.30. So it looks like the Bureau of Purchasing is in dire need of executive chairs. So I better hurry up and, and look at this. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I've been, I've, I've registered already as a supplier. So I have a, a login and password. On the top right corner of your screen, you will see sign in or register. If you click on it. Obviously, if you are new to Supplier Portal, you will go through the registration process. If you already have an account, you would click on sign in, which I'm going to do now. Um, I'm going to enter my login right now. I'm going to all ask you to close your eyes, not to look at my password, um, since I don't want to share it with everybody. But anyway, um, this is how you would access. And let's see. First. Now. It works. Uh, so now I'm in my account on the supply portal. Uh, as you can see, my name is in the right corner, which um, is connected to the account that I created under my name. It brings me right away to the uh, event section, but um, this is if you would not bring to that page the same as I've shown you before, you would go on the top left menu, you would see events, browse open events. And again, it's gonna show you what is currently posted on the supplier portal. So I see executive chairs, ITQ is the one that I'm looking for. When you, um, I'm gonna pause for a second. When you um, register as a supplier, last week we talked to you about the importance of selecting community codes during your registration process. If you, weren't, uh, if you did not attend last week, I just wanna emphasize that the reason why we, uh, ask you to um, uh, choose a committee code is because the Bureau of Purchasing, when we issue an event through the supply portal, we select committee codes that are connected to the event that we're posting. With this committee code, it's going to pull the list of suppliers that have registered for that code with their email addresses. And when we release that event on the supplier portal, the 
system will release, um, will generate an email notification that you will receive to your email address, which will warn you um, that there's an event for which a committee code has been chosen that you selected that you would want to look at it. And I'm going to show you uh, where on top of it in your account, this message is going to see. So if you look at the menu, I clicked on messages and dialogue. I created a, a couple of events this morning. And the one that um, I created at first, which is event one, two, three, four, it shows you this message that you received, that I received at uh, 9 a.m., 9.20 this morning. Below is the content of that email that uh, was sent to, to me that I got through uh, my email address with various links. This one is not a live link on this message, but on your email, it will be. And it's telling you basically that you're about to, uh, that uh, the city is about to release um, this ITQ for the committee code that I chose, giving me some of the information that um, mentioned before the opening date and the closing date. And with this link, it helps you through your email to go to the supplier portal through uh, Office um, to access your uh, the supplier portal to register, sign in, and to go in. Um, but this is where you would see most of the email notification that the system is generating. So uh, I created three events this morning, as you can see, three different messages that I received. Now, um, again, I want to submit a proposal for this ITQ1234. So what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to events, browse open events. I'm now going to uh, select the event that I want to submit a proposal against. Um, I'm going to double click to open that event. Um, obviously, on the supply portal, before signing in, you can look at those documents and information that are under the attachments tab. This is where um, every time you look at an event, you would want to go to because this is where the documentation is located. So I'm um, going to click on the attachment that's in blue. This is the actual document that you want to open. And this is the invitation to quote that Kai talked to you a little bit before. Um, as she said during um, a presentation, what's important to see is this is the date. Um, by which the event's going to close, that I need to submit a response before that, that date, but before that time of 9.30 CST. You have the contact information of the buyer um, from the Bureau of Purchasing who is responsible to oops, <laughs> submit uh, this ITQ. So if you have any question and answer, you can use that email address, that phone number. Um, you can also use the feature I'm going to show you in a portal. Uh, this is an ITQ for material, equipment, and supplies. So it kind of gives you an idea, a little bit of an idea of what the type of good or services that the city is looking for. Uh, this section um, has the title, um, which could be uh, very short, as uh, it is the case here. It could be a bit longer, but um, you have the general instructions on how to uh, register and, and submit your bid, uh, terms and conditions that are obviously invite you all to review before you submit a proposal. It's critical to understand the, the rules of that ITQ. And then if you go to the second page, um, you'll find some of the similar information, but additional one, especially the delivery, um, and then the specification. This is where um, our office um, um, write the specification that were provided to us by departments. In this example, it's ourselves. So we looked at the chairs that we, we had in our conference room and uh, what type of chairs that we're looking to, to replace. So obviously uh, um, it could get a lot of details. And we in our experience has been the uh, most helpful for vendors obviously to know as much as possible. And then you wanna go uh, all the way down um, to that ITQ to make sure you're not missing anything. It's as, as Kai said, it's really important to read everything um, so that you understand it. But obviously, if you don't understand, that should raise a question that you should submit to, to the buyer. An ITQ, as you've seen, uh, is typically uh, three, four pages. It could be a little bit longer, but it's typically uh, uh, three, four pages for an ITQ. Um, if I did not understand the specification or I wanted to ask for an extension, or if the city, the Bureau of Purchasing would consider an extension, 
um, to uh, to move the date of submission, or if I want to submit uh, maybe um, a question about a product that I have to see if that matches what they want, I can use the Q&A forum. Uh, this is where you can submit a question uh, through Brass that the buyer would um, uh, see on, on their end and will have to uh, relay that question to the department, especially if it relates to specification or if it's a question that purchasing can answer as the uh, um, department responsible for the purchasing activity for the process, we will respond also. But typically questions are for the department and it could be one where, like I said, you want to know if the product that you have is um, um, uh, responsive to what the city is looking for at the Bureau of Purchasing. So we would answer yeah, an addendum that we would post to that event so that everybody, um, everybody who is looking to uh, submit a proposal will see the response because uh, we don't respond to somebody in particular, we respond to everybody. So your question um, is supposed to benefit all prospective vendors. Um, I've looked at the ITQ. I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready to submit a proposal. So as you see um, in that uh, above the word version, you have this button called, called "Respond Now." So this is where I'm going to click "Respond Now." Um, you have the option of either accepting the terms and condition for this event. So again, it's really critical to read all the terms and condition that are um, um, linked and written into a solicitation um, because by clicking this button that means that you've agreed to those um, if you do not wish to be on this event you can also click this way but here i really want to submit a proposal and i've read everything you know what's expected i'm just going to move to the next step which now is asking me to uh, respond to the event so an event um, typically as a, a one line or more, depending on how descriptive the event is. In this case, this is, a, uh, I went through the most um, um, easier, the easiest example possible, which is we're just asking for prize for executive chairs. But sometime um, we had the example earlier of the ITQ for North Sea with a, a summer camp t-shirts. They could be different lines because they're looking for different types, maybe different type of size. A color um, or maybe brand and so um, this can be longer on this screen it can be um, 10 15 and more lines um, but in this case for this ITQ uh, there's only one line I'm going to open the line which by double clicking on that on that on that line gives me a, a summary again and then I can um, enter some of the information that I want to do so um, uh, since it's an item that needs to be delivered, um, um, I'm going to tell the, the department that I can provide those ex executive chairs by, uh, by Tuesday after Memorial Day weekend. Um, quantity, uh, that's where I'm going to give them the, the prices that I want to, uh, for, for one share, is going to cost $30. Obviously, this is a test. It's, it's not representative of any <laughs> accurate number for executive chair, but just for the exercise, um, I'm just gonna give uh, this number. I could enter some additional description that I can provide. I'm gonna now click next, um, which after that, um, I'm gonna can click on, on finish um, to submit my, my response. But um, you, know, you just have the ability to provide more information as you need, um, but it's critical to enter the basic information to respond um, to uh, that event. So this is where you just basically give your pricing a quantity unit for this for this uh, for this response. But um, we expect with an ITQ for you to submit also your actual proposal, a document issued by you, your company that confirms what the amount is that you're showing to the line. So I'm gonna click next. This is where um, it's called response attachment. This is where we're gonna expect you to attach your proposal, put whichever document that you generate, uh, you or your company generates to uh, confirm that it's in, in aligning with the, uh, the price that you are proposing to for the city. Um, I'm just going to attach 
uh, a document here for this exercise to show you that it's showing that it's creating a line with a document here in blue that I can open. I'm ready to uh, submit a response. And this is the last step uh, that it's uh, critical to go through because if you don't click submit, uh, that response is not being, uh, not cross over into our system. So we don't know that you have um, uh, submitted a proposal. So once you uh, click submit, confirm, congratulations, your response has been submitted. And I'm gonna show you where you can um, uh, look at your responses, whichever one you've submitted for various events. So if you go to events and you go to my responses, you have a, um, five tabs that are showing on, on here. So here is obviously will, those tabs will keep track of uh, an event that you did not submit your response. It will show here. I'm gonna show you uh, in a second. Um, this, the first three tabs are depending on the type of event that you're responding to. But if you have not submitted your proposal, just started, created it, didn't finish, this is where it will show. If you submit your response, this is where your response will be showing. So I responded, I just responded to event one, two, three, four for those ex executive chairs. Uh, earlier today, I also responded to that other event, one, two, three, five, this one for mailroom furniture. And as you see, it gives you a, a very brief summary of when this event opened, when it's closing, the event status, when it says open, that means that the event is still live. And then confirmation of your response status um, is submitted. The event that the, if, if the event is not closed yet and you feel like you need to change your response and you've not been, uh, uh, want to make the, uh, a, different, a different response. So what you're going to do is you go back to the events. We have uh, submitted your response. And then um, you can click on view your response. Event line response is another section where you can look at the details. Um, you can see the attachment that you've submitted with it. And uh, I want to go into that line. And I just want to I just want to change it. Uh, I've, I have um, something that I've not. Um, let's see. I just wanted to change it and unsubmit it so to get back. So I'm sorry. So go back to this tab of response open for Word. If you right click on this, you can modify your response. You can withdraw your response. Obviously, it's critical to do this before the event closes because once the event closes, you cannot do anything. Neither do I. Neither do I because I've, on our side, on the purchasing side, the event is closed. We can't make any modification to the submission. But if I want to modify my response, it's going to ask me to confirm uh, whether I want to do that or not. So by clicking yes, I modified it. So I'm going to go back to the event. So I went a little bit faster than I wanted to. Um, and you see on the event one, two, three, four for executive chairs, I want to edit my edit, edit my response. I'm gonna click on that. And then I could go backward to wherever I wanted to change something. So if I want to change the pricing, I can change it here. I have to resubmit to do next again. Submit again. Probably would have to update and do another proposal. Add the document, a revised document. That's the, act, the same document that I use, but I imagine that you obviously change your proposals. So you have a different document to, to submit. I'm going to go next. And then I want to submit my response. And again, your response has been submitted. The modifier response has been submitted. And you can see that it's now showing again in the response for open award. It's now 
um, submitted again. So when it's submitted, that means that your proposal is now on our side, on the city side as an actual proposal that once the event closes, this proposal will be part of the ones that will evaluate for responsiveness. We will also provide information to department as to who is the lowest and who is the second, third, and fourth, depending on who that is. Once we get a confirmation from the department as to whether they want to move forward with the award to the lowest bidder, um, then um, our office will handle that award in the system. And for an ITQ, we typically um, convert an ITQ into a purchase order. So at that point, the award and a purchase order, you will receive a notification if you the winning um, selected bidder of, um, of a purchase order that will allow you to continue doing the, the work and provide the chairs in this example or services and goods that the city are ordered uh, via an ITQ. So that, 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 that's the end of this presentation on how to um, respond to an opportunity. Um, but obviously, again, as I said earlier, we have um, an, a tutorial on the, um, on the supply portal for you to use. Let me go back to um, the presentation. Um, now, I just wanted to um, explain to you how procurement and DBE are connected. So the Office of Supply Diversity um, is involved in a review, a formal solicitation that departments are um, submitting to purchasing for release. So the example that Kai brought up to you before about the RFP for the emergency transportation for home and security or the bid for EMD for truck and repairs are going through a review by the Office of Supply Diversity. We'll make sure that um, either the uh, DBE program um, applies to that procurement or could be waived if there's no um, DBE opportunity. Um, another way that obviously our uh, procurement and DBA connected is uh, through the, the, the forms that we incorporate in our procurement. And so when the DBA program applies, we have specific sections in ABAs and RFPs and RFQs that draw the attention to a prospective uh, respondents and bidders to look uh, at what type of forms they need to prepare and submit to show the good faith efforts and what plan they have in place to. Um, include the DB program in that proposal. And finally, this is a new feature that we, uh, that we started recently in response to the pandemic and the challenges that we faced in having a meet, virtual meetings where before the pandemic, this would present an opportunity for DBE as well as non-DBE and primes to meet up during uh, conference meetings, uh, whether it was a pre similar conference or or a pre-bid submission conference that um, we uh, are now including, at least in our RFP and RFQs, and we're gonna move toward that in ITBs as well um, for um, a section called DB interest. And I invite you to look at some of the example of RFP and RFQ we mentioned in our presentation to look at for that section where uh, basically we've created a questionnaire um, that you can access through uh, the RFP or the RFQ and a questionnaire that um, helps us collect information as who you are, um, name of your company, what do you do, what type of services do you offer, but also asking you, do you wish to be um, a DBE for this event that we published, or do you wish to maybe join forces with somebody else to submit a proposal? We collect that information and we post that information via an addendum during the procurement so that information is uh, offered to everybody who is looking at this addendum to prepare the response that they can see that some um, DBE companies have um, submitted their interest in participating in a proposal for that study station. So this is a new feature that, that we launched um, recently and uh, invite you to, to look at that in, in um, current examples that we have out there. So uh, this is a narrow transition. Uh, for part three regarding the DBA requirements, and I'm gonna uh, leave it to Matthew to take over. Uh, 
Apologies for that delay, but I was having some mouse troubles. <laughs> Couldn't click the unmute button. Uh, thank you, Julianne. Um, so yes, I'm here to discuss the DBE requirements uh, that are applied to uh, contracts, to invitations, to bid, and to uh, RFPs and RFQs. And <clears throat> so all bidders, respondents, contractors are required to adhere to the city's Equitable Business Opportunities Program ordinance found within section 70 dash 456 through 70 dash 467 of the city's code of ordinances and the DBE policy found within policy memorandum number 46 R. Uh, the city of New Orleans default DBE goal on contracts is 35 percent however select contracts may have a tailored goal and that will be noted in the solicitation. Bidders and respondents are required to submit all applicable DBE forms and relevant documents to be considered responsive. Those forms are always included uh, in the invitation to bid or RFP or via addendum. Be sure to check the brass uh, portal for uh, those uh, forms. And they are also always found on Supplier Diversity's webpage. The EBO program and DBE goals are applied to all City of New Orleans contracts where public funding or incentives are utilized. There are exemptions, the uh, procurement of immu Im immovable property, resolution of any legal claim, cooperative endeavor agreements, CEAs, any procurement to satisfy declared emergency needs. Uh, restoration tax abatement credits for owner-occupied residential properties that do not exceed six units. Any procurement or contract, except for those of public works, valued at less than the applicable formal competitive bid, competitive procurement threshold. Uh, that I believe for goods and non-professional services is twenty thousand. And then any procurement contract valued at $15,000 or less. Uh, that is where DBE policy is not applied. Um, as Julian had mentioned, uh, sometimes the DBE goal is waived and that is done for a variety of reasons. That may be because that it is a sole source procurement. It may be that we have reviewed our DBE directory and see that there are no DBEs that are certified in that area, or maybe that the solicitation is not subcontractable, thus DBE participation is unachievable. For RFPs and RFQs, uh, respondents are required to submit a completed DBE participation plan form, the DBE Compliance Form 3, with their proposal slash qualification submission. And that outlines how the respondent will achieve the DBE goal, which DBE firms will participate on the team, and the respondent's DBE history. Select RFQs may only require an affidavit to acknowledge the DBE policy, but subsequent RFPs that follow that RFQ will require a DBE compliance form. This will be stated in the solicitation. Now, any selected respondents will be required to submit a completed DBE responsiveness form. And this is the DBE compliance form one. Uh, this is requested to be submitted within 10 days of notification of the intent to award. This form details which DBE firms will be utilized to meet the DBE goal. And all firms listed on that form must be utilized on the project. Um, good faith efforts are required to be made and demonstrated on all applicable City of New Orleans contracts. And if a bidder has not attained the DBE goal, then they are required to complete and submit the good faith efforts form, also known as the DBE Compliance Form 2, along with any and all supporting documentation showing their good faith efforts. All on, for invitations to bid, all bidders shall anticipate submitting the DBE compliance form one. The two lowest bidders will be required to submit a completed DBE responsiveness form, the compliance form one, within three days of the bid opening. 
uh, this form, again, details which DBE firms will be utilized to meet the DBE goal, and all firms listed on that form must be utilized on the project. If the bidder is unable to meet the goal, just as with the previously stated, good faith efforts are required, and you will be submitting those with the DBE compliance form two, along with the supporting documentation. Bidder or respondents that are unable to achieve the DB contracts gold, as stated, must provide good faith efforts to do so. This is done so on form two. Any attachments must be identified and supplied with form two. If a bidder or proposer fails to submit DB compliance form two and all required good faith efforts documentation, the bid shall be considered non-responsive. Now, good faith efforts include, but are not limited to, identifying opportunities for DBEs within the, within the contract, contacting DBEs certified in relevant scopes of work, advertising to DBE firms, including posting on our DBE opportunities page on NOLA.gov, following up with those DBEs that they initially reached out to, and negotiating in good faith with DBEs. Other uh, forms or explanations uh, shall be included as well uh, for the firm to demonstrate that they did try to meet the goal and that they did in fact reach out to firms and afforded DBEs the opportunity to be part of the contract. Now for counting DBE participation, DBE firms must be certified with either the SLDBE program or with the Louisiana Unified Certification Program. They must be certified in the respective listed scopes of work. So if you are listing a DBE firm for masonry, they must be certified in masonry. Both directories are linked on OSD's webpage on NOLA.gov um, under supplier diversity and you'll see DBE directory. Now DBEs can be a prime contractor and count towards the goal. They may count towards 100% of the DBE goal as they are the prime, provided that they have committed to the DBE goal and are performing a minimum of 30% of the contract with their own forces. DBEs who furnish and install may count 100% of the labors and supplies costs towards the DBE goal provided they are the ones who purchase the supplies. DBE manufacturers of materials and supplies may be counted towards 100% of their contract amount. For example, ready mix concrete manufacturers who supply concrete are counted at 100%. However, DBE suppliers may only be counted towards 60% of their total contract amount. So if all that firm do is providing is supplies to the project, only 60% of what they provide may be counted. Commercially useful function. DBEs must perform a commercially useful function. In determining whether a DBE certified firm is performing commercially useful function, the following shall be considered. Whether the firm has the skill and expertise to perform the work for which it is being utilized and possesses all necessary licenses. Whether the firm is in the business of performing, managing, or supervising the work for which it has been certified and will be utilized. And whether it is performing a real and actual service that is distinct and verifiable element of the work called for in the contract. DB firms must be performing work that is directly related to the contract. The Office of Supplier Diversity's compliance team is charged with monitoring and reporting DBE participation on city contracts to ensure DBE firms get their share of procurement opportunities. Uh, the B2G Now compliance monitoring system is used for reporting DBE participation and compliance reports are required from each contractor and subcontractor on a monthly basis. Compliance officers may conduct announced and unannounced vis site visits to monitor contract compliance in the field. And this is our compliance team. Uh, we have Andre Brown, Latoya Martin, 
uh, myself, Matthew Cullinan, and Monique Bourgeois um, to assist and uh, monitor contracts. Thank you, Julien. Back to you. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Um, this end the uh, part three on DBE requirements. Let me try to move to the next page. Um, conclusion. So we prepare you to understand the different methods of procurement to respond to an event, in this case was an ITQ, and to comply with the uh, DBE requirements. Um, do not forget to sign up for session three, which is this Thursday. Uh, we'll talk about the payment process and the DBE monitoring. As Ms. Margaret said at the beginning, this event will be virtual and will start at 1.30. Uh, now we can get to the question and answer uh, session. So feel free to use the uh, chat feature to submit your, your question and uh, we can um, then read to everybody and, um, and, and, and respond. So there are no questions. Obviously, um, we're happy to answer every question, but as you can see on the slide as well, um, welcome input and question and comments. Um, if you don't think about it right now, mm -hmm. but just as you uh, leave the meeting and it just comes up to you right away and you wish you had asked, well, you can use our email address at procurement.brass and nola.gov to submit your question or your comment as well, because we welcome feedback, obviously. Um, we're using the subject line of your email being business information session slash introduction to city business slash question comment. But, um, any questions? Well, Julian, I think I should say this is about, you must have been very informative um, we just got one in the chat. Are the online brass tutorials interactive? So unfortunately they're not. Um, this is why um, um, we are launched with uh, colleagues from the Office of Economic Development, those recording in virtual sessions to take the opportunity um, to have a, a part of our presentation uh, being um, uh, interactive in the sense of other than showing you slides, it's going through the process. However, we do understand the need for that connection and um, we do have the ability to assist in, a, in an interactive way. If you submit a, a question a request to procurement.bras and nola.gov. Um, now we don't necessarily assist while you are submitting a proposal, but um, our buyers, our staff who is, um, who are in charge of, um, of uh, procurement um, are able to assist um, at the time of the submission of an event if you need to. But we also are looking into um, potential future workshops, working with, uh, with vendors, giving the opportunity to come in and, and test and, and try as well. So right now it's not, but we're looking at those options. If you obviously have a need, the immediate need to respond to an event and understand um, how to submit your response, please contact the buyer record in the three station so we can assist you. Okay, we have another one is, um, are there ongoing opportunities to access routine maintenance as a procurement opportunity? Mm, um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Mr. Mr. Timo. Um, apologize if I don't pronounce your last name correctly. Would you Would you mind um, um, adding some some details to your question by accessing routine maintenance? Um, hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. 
hey, so thank you for the presentation. So like for regular routine uh, items of maintenance, like uh, sidewalks, uh, other things that might be considered as routine maintenance, are there procurement opportunities that, that, um, that are available uh, that the city normally engages that you might not do in-house? Yes, so um, um, we, um, we in the past, uh, the city has issued what we call like job order contract solicitation that the uh, Department of Property Management is primarily responsible for and we are working uh, uh, with them um, to reissue future solicitation on, um, on them repairs um, for um, city facilities. We're looking at how to uh, re-procure it in a sense of um, either by area, zone of the city or type of buildings. We've done that way for janitorial services, for example, where uh, the Department of Property Management divided up the, the scope of work into the, uh, the surface of the facility. So um, that's how we uh, we able to um, develop at least uh, three uh, different type of contracts, but it's in um, it's definitely in, in the works. I would say without unattended uh, to develop um, maintenance uh, future maintenance contract, not only for property management, also for uh, Department of Public Works as well, uh, is looking at um, redoing the maintenance contracts and dividing up potentially in zones and areas of the city. Um, so I invite you to, um, uh, to keep looking at the, the website, but also, I don't know if you were there last Thursday uh, for our presentation, but um, we'll have the uh, contact of our, our buyer's contact information on the Bureau of Purchasing website. We're going to add the type of department that they are assisting, and you can uh, reach in to them, especially the for department, department of Public Works or Property Management to ask if they know of any upcoming opportunities. We're working on developing an outlook for all the supply community uh, to when we know what departments are trying to do in the next two or three months. So I give you a heads up by what's coming up. But um, yeah, it's in the works. I unfortunately don't have a timeline I can share with you, but yeah, definitely uh, we're looking at DPW, property management, maybe other department as well, because like for example, North Sea, the airport, uh, they have their own maintenance unit library as well so they they may end up having their own contract as well so um uh, please continue to monitor and contact us okay um he's asking the uh his email should be in the presentation um and if you would like a copy of the presentation you could just email me margaret um mo-mcgee at nola.gov and I'll definitely get that presentation to you. Julie, your email is connected to the, the presentation. I said again, Margaret, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't Is your email on the, the presentation? It is not, but I need to correct that. My, my email address, which can be found on the Bureau of Purchasing website as well, it's J-P-M-E-Y-E-R at NOLA.gov. J-P-M-E-Y-E-R at NOLA.gov. See, we had a, a question uh, from Chris Van Deren, Deren Donk. Uh, it was mentioned to find out what the city has budgeted. How do we find? So um, I had to give you that answer, which is depends. <laughs> it depends on the procurement method um, because um, for public works, for constructions and uh, facilities or, or road, road work, they typically um, during the pre mill conference meeting give you information as to what the estimated cost for the project, so typically that, that, that would give you an idea of what the what is the budget of the city, uh, what they can spend for, for that project. Uh, for other type of procurement methods, um, it, it's not always uh, provided because um, departments may have um, a budget for an item, but they're not sure that uh, they're getting the 
um, it's not necessarily sure what how much is going to cost them. So that's an opportunity for them to see if they are way under budget or way over budget uh, with their proposals. So the ITQ typically do not do not say what's their budget. But um, as a procurement method, an ITQ is for purchase of goods and services are in between a thousand dollar and less than twenty thousand. So that's the range that the department uh, has to um, issue an ITQ. RFP and RFQ, RFQ typically won't know the budget because it's primarily based on qualifications. And as uh, Kai said earlier, um, for architect and engineer, it's purely on their qualification. For law department, for example, when they did the RFQ, they basically would tell you how much they would pay by the hour. Um, in the case also sometime with the RFQ for a hearing officer, they'll tell you what the department is willing to pay by the hour. Um, they may share what's their budget, but um, it's not always the case. For an RFP, um, typically don't don't provide that that information, but that could be a, that could be a subject to an addendum um, if requested and if the department is willing to share that information. It's um, it could be done via um, an addendum, but typically public works you that's the distinction. Public works you will know what the estimated cost is. For the others, um, ITQ, you know that the range of a, their budget could be between $1,000 up to 20. Uh, for the other methods, um, it's not necessarily uh, shared what type of budget they have. But you can, you can find out also, you can try to find out what would be the budget by looking at past contracts that the city and the department may have, have, with, may have had with a prior vendor by uh, getting copies of the prior contract, you could see how much uh, was the contract for. And especially if you have maybe the last addendum, would tell you how much the money uh, the city has spent for those services. Thank you, Julian. Are there any more questions? Am I able to bid on contracts while clearing up a compliance issue? So, not sure if it's a compliance issue in terms of DB compliance. Yes, um, I, I think that's uh, geared toward the DBE compliance and um, I guess it would be like if they're in the process and they haven't actually been certified, um, would that hinder them uh, bidding on a contract? Um, well, oh, this is Matthew Cullen. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what Andrea was asking, but to answer your question, uh, a, a firm must be certified at the time of the bid submission in order to be counted. If they're not certified at that time, they cannot be counted uh, towards the DBE goal. And uh, you must show, demonstrate how you will meet the DBE goal. It can't be with the expectation that the firm will be certified. That firm must be certified at that time. Now, if a firm has a compliance issue on another contract, they are welcome to bid on, on a contract um, it would only be in an instance if OSD had found egregious uh, compliance errors and had issued a notice that uh, they found that bidder non-responsible. May that ever come into play? That's pretty rare, and that would involve some extreme um, non-compliance on, on the part of the contractor. Okay, and if, if uh, I want to just clarify, um, all, all individuals that want to bid on uh, a contract with procurement, it's not necessarily that they have to be DBE certified, but it is very uh, suggested that they are. Am I correct? Yeah, you, the, you do not have to be DBE certified to bid on a contract. Um, yes, but, but it's very encouraged. It's certainly encouraged. Um, being DBE certified means that you count towards the DBE goal uh, that is on the contract. Thanks, Matt. 
Any more questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up today. Um, thanks, Julian, Kai, and Matthew uh, for this very informative presentation. Thank you all for attending uh, today's session. Remember Thursday, we will discuss uh, the payment process and we hope to see you then. Uh, if you have any questions, once we uh, close out this meeting, you can always email me at momcgee at nola.gov and I'll definitely get those answers to you. Oh, thank you. Wait, I, I thought, I, okay, no, they were saying thank you. I thought I saw two more questions down at the bottom. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Hope to see you on Thursday. Thank you very much. Have a great day. See you Bye. on Thursday.